Okay. Um, if you could take your seats if you want to join us. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Seamus Hughes. I am the Deputy Director of the Program on Extremism um, at George Washington University. And it is an honor um, to have this panel together. You've had a number of talks on the legal track about, okay, so we have this extremism problem. It's growing. What are the legal strategies available to do so? Uh, we have about, they say 54 minutes, but I think I can go a little bit longer. We've got a little bit of time um, to talk about uh, one particular strategy, which is um, the D.C. Uh, Attorney General sued the Proud Boys in well, almost a year ago now, right? Um, a number of Proud Boys uh, members have been arrested um, by Department of Justice. There's a number of legal um, approaches that are happening there. So I have a distinguished pan set of, of panelists who will dive into um, different aspects of uh, their understanding and relationship or lack thereof with the Proud Boys. Uh, and then we'll open it up to questions. Just really quickly on logistics, if you have a question, there is a QR code on both sides. You can scan it. It comes into this fancy iPad, and hopefully that works for me. And if it doesn't, we'll just yell, uh, and we'll go from there. So I'm going to do a very quick bio, but please feel free to expand uh, if you are. So to the right is, is Vikram Swar Swarup. Yes. Swarup. Swarup. Oh, man, I thought I was going to get that one right on the first try. Uh, he's the Chief Deputy Attorney General for the Office of the Attorney General for District of Columbia. Uh, immediately next to him is Colin McDonnell, who is a counsel for the States United Democracy Center. Reverend Bill Lamar, who's a pastor at Metropolitan AME Church. And Michael Jensen, who's a senior researcher at the University of Maryland START program. And so I ask them all to have um, brief opening remarks. Then we'll dive into questions. We'll actually have a conversation uh, and see if we can learn some things here that we can use for other groups. Sure. All right. Thank you so much. And thanks to the organizers of the um, summit for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, Attorney General Carl Racine sends his regards and regrets that he couldn't be here. As many of you all know, um, A.G. Racine was the president of the National Association of Attorneys General, and as part of that, um, he got to host an initiative, a year-long study on a single issue that every president gets to do, and his was on combating hate. So many of the themes and discussions that we're having here are very much in line with the issues that he has focused on during his tenure as president of NAG. Um, one of the things that was the focus of that initiative is the rise of hate groups, groups like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers. At that point, um, the initiative was in uh, was last year in 2020. Uh, that seemed theoretical and an issue of emerging uh, problems across the country, but little did we know that it was going to be so applicable in our own um, hometown shortly after the end of his tenure. So, you know, we uh, at the D.C. Attorney General's office filed the first lawsuit by a local, state or local government against these groups related to the January 6th insurrection. And these groups are the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers. And, and what we're trying to do is to really bring some accountability from a governmental pers perspective as distinct from what you heard um, in, um, uh, from folks on the last two panels related to private plaintiffs who brought um, through nonprofits claims against um, the Charlottesville attackers. Um, to do so, we partnered with the ADL, with States United, um, with Paul Weiss and Deckert um, to bring this lawsuit. And so you'll hear a little bit more about that partnership uh, and our legal theories in a minute. But before we do that, I just wanted to take a step back and sort of explain who these groups are, what was going on here, um, because it's, it's a little bit different than what we may understand just from the surface of the January 6th attack. The Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers are, are organizations with a violent ideology. Really, there's violence wherever these groups gather together, um, and you know, violence is core to their mission. And they really looked at 2020 and saw an opportunity to spread their message, to increase recruitment, and to just grow uh, the organizations and, and really spread their ideology. And that was in the, both the lead up to the 2020 election as well as in the immediate aftermath. So in the two months between the election and the January 6th attack, these groups were in the District of Columbia on several instances and caused havoc and uh, unleashed violence on our communities, particularly our most vulnerable communities and our communities of color, which um, I'm sure Reverend Lamar will touch on um, later in this panel. What we learned 
And then I think everybody knows exactly what happened on January 6th, but what we learned after that was really how coordinated that attack had been. It was really planned, thought out. Um, there was extensive amount of coordination that went in between the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, and several of their members to do what, um, to, to unleash the havoc that they unleashed on the Capitol and interrupt the peaceful transition of power that we'll hear more about. So, um, so from congressional reports and media reports, we've all learned a lot about what happened that day when members of both groups openly rioted, broke through police barriers, and assaulted police officers, you know, uh, caused tremendous fear among members of Congress and the vice president. Um, we know that um, the incidents caused deaths. Several people who were at the Capitol that day um, have died as a result of those attacks. Our complaint d goes into all of that, but as I said, we're really also focused on what happened before that, the real coordination and organization that went into the attack. So let me talk a little bit about why it was important for the District of Columbia to bring a case as opposed to you know, the, some of the other folks who have also brought cases. And before I do that, I want to describe a little bit about what those other cases are. Members of Congress have filed um, a couple of lawsuits against the January 6th insurrectionists for the uh, for the harms that they suffered, um, and they've also sued uh, President Trump. Um, and in addition, um, you know, there's been lawsuits brought by Capitol Police officers as well. Um, those are all civil suits. And in, uh, on top of that, about 900 um, individuals have been arrested and prosecuted for their role in the January 6th attack, and about a third of those uh, folks have pleaded guilty to various crimes arising out of that. And of course, the January 6th Committee in Congress is also looking into the planning and um, organization of that attack. So with that backdrop, let, uh, let me just explain a little bit about why it was critical for us as the District of Columbia to bring this lawsuit. So first of all, the District of Columbia itself was significantly injured by the events of January 6th. So you know, once it became clear that the, that the insurrectionists were crossing through the barriers at the Capitol, the District of Columbia's municipal police department, the Metropolitan Police Department, is the backstop for a lot of these federal protests and federal um, issues that get out of control. And so our police officers were deployed to that, um, to the scene of the incident, and a significant number of them were injured um, during the attack that continued. And we, as a District of Columbia, as the employer of these police officers, are responsible, of course, for paying the medical bills and, the on and for the ongoing care that they need as a result of the attack. On top of that, what I wanted to highlight really is that the January 6th attack was a tr significant traumatic experience for DC residents. And I think a lot of times we don't have a clear understanding of what ordinary people who live in the District of Columbia experience when something like this happens. And something like this is an, you know, a national event, but it affects real people who are just trying to go about their lives in DC. And these are the same types of people that don't have a voice in our federal government and in our federal system um, such that they can't be heard in terms of the prosecutor of these offenses, which is a federal prosecutor. Um, there's much less um, local accountability than there is in other jurisdictions. So that was really one of the core reasons for the civil suit, is an opportunity for D.C. residents to be heard and to have their moral and um, you know, just logistical challenges and uncertainty that resulted from this violent attack to be vindicated. So let me just conclude by laying out some of the goals of our case. We're seeking financial damages from the Proud Boys organization, the Oath Keepers organization, and all of the members of those organizations that we've sued for, the, for those injuries that we've suffered, for those out-of-pocket costs that we are paying out to MPD to our police officers and, um, uh, and the property damage as well. These injuries are substantial, and if paying those bills bankrupts these organizations, we view that as a good thing. Um, so that's, that's a strategy that's worked with, a, with many other violent hate groups over our history. Um, and if that means that they can't orchestrate additional um, uh, events of this scale, events of lawlessness, either at the Capitol or at school boards or town halls or city council meetings across the country, that's a good thing. Um, we're also seeking to make sure that this never happens again. 
by hitting the insurrectionists in their pocketbooks, we're trying to make it harder for them to commit acts that harm our democracy. And lastly, and we're seeking justice for our brave law enforcement officers. Um, those officers were, you know, were sustained bruises, lacerations, shattered spinal discs, cracked ribs, wounds from being hit in, in, with a metal fence stick, and concussions from being held, hit with large metal objects, including American flagpoles. Some officers were sprayed in the face with chemical irritants, including bear mace, and shot with stun guns. So these are significant injuries that we're trying to vindicate. And you know, we heard from police officers after January 6 that they didn't feel like what they had suffered was being adequately represented in the public process. And so this is an important tool for that. And lastly, we're seeking accountability. Holding wrongdoers accountable is a fundamental American value. And it's at the core of the responsibilities of a local government like ours. So with those sort of broad initial thoughts, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, my co-panelists um, to get into a little bit more of, of information regarding our legal theories, and then we'll have a discussion. Thanks, Vikram. Hey, everybody. I'm Colin McDonnell. I'm counsel at States United Democracy Center. Uh, before joining States United, I was a federal prosecutor and appellate litigator at the Department of Justice. Um, and at States United, I focus on our accountability efforts. States United is a nonpartisan um, nonprofit with bipartisan leadership, and we focus on securing um, free, fair, and secure elections. Um, another way of putting that is to make sure that people can vote and that the person who wins the election gets to take office. Um, it's unfortunate that that is no. uh, that that's controversial uh, these times. In any event, um, uh, we primarily advance that work um, by assisting state and local officials with the extremely important work that they do in that end. And we focus on four issue areas. Um, one is election protection. One is holding people who subvert or try to undermine democracy accountable. Another is preventing political violence. And lastly, we seek to promote truthful information as opposed to disinformation about um, our democracy and our elections. And so as co-counsel in the lawsuit against the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers, that's kind of at the intersection of our work on political violence and accountability. And as Vikram mentioned, we're co-counsel on this case with the, the Attorney General's office. Um, the law firms Paul Weiss and Deckard, I see at least some Paul Weiss representation in the audience. Um, they're all doing tremendous work. And the Anti-Defamation League, um, and maybe time allowing or in the questions, we can talk a little bit about this government, private, nonprofit partnership and litigation and kind of what, what that's about and what some of the benefits of that, that sort of partnership are. Um, but I want to focus my remarks on complementing some of what Vikram talked about, um, both talking a little bit about what our legal theories are and, and also um, expanding on some of the facts um, at issue in this case, alleged in our complaint, uh, kind of through the lens of, of this as um, an anti-democratic effort. And, and I really want to emphasize something that, that Vikram said, that this was January 6, what happened, um, at least insofar as the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers are concerned, was not a spontaneous event. It was not a protest that got a little rowdy and one thing led to another. This was planned. And if you read our complaint, you'll see we devote um, not just, not a, we devote a lot of attention not just to what happened, the horrific events that happened on January 6, but the events that were set in motion long before then that led up to it. The Proud Boys and Oath Keepers, um, they identified January 6, um, wasn't a coincidence. Uh, January 6, a little overview. So by, by that point, the election has occurred. The votes have been counted. The electors from each state have voted. It is known who won the presidential election. But 
the Constitution and U.S. law requires that on January 6th, all the votes of those electors are counted by the vice president at a session of Congress. That's a required step. Um, and these groups identified that as an opportunity to disrupt the peaceful transfer of power. So long before that day, they began recruiting additional members to help with the attack. They began financing and purchasing weapons, tactical gear, communications equipment. They began planning a coordinated attack, how to break through barriers, um, how to attack different places at once to divide law enforcement um, and weaken the response. And they were prepared to use violence against anyone who stood in their way, um, including law enforcement officers. They were prepared to use threats and intimidation against uh, federal officials, members of Congress, who had duties that they had to carry out that day to certify the election. Um, and so that, that there was this, um, this preparation, that there was this plan that relates um, to the, the causes of action, the legal theories that we rely on. So we allege multiple claims. Some of them are conspiracy um, and I guess in a non-legalese term. That's basically an agreement to do something unlawful between two or more people. So we allege various conspiracies, conspiracies to commit violent crimes like um, assault, battery, and the like. Um, but I, I want to talk about one of the, what I think is the most interesting statute that we rely on, and it comes from the Ku Klux Klan Act. Um, this act was passed a little over 150 years ago, um, Reconstruction Era law signed by Ulysses S. Grant, and it was used back then in efforts to combat um, Ku Klux Klan. Um, their violence and intimidation, including violence and intimidation aimed at disrupting elections, disrupting the right to vote. Um, so it's um, interesting that, that that law has made a bit of, um, been a bit of a revival of its use, um, which is perhaps a reminder that um, although you know, we tend to think of the problems we face today as unique and, and in some ways, some ways they are, but in some ways um, we might be looking at just a new version of, a, of, of long-standing problems. Um, so the, the KKK Act, there, there are different ways you can prove a violation of um, the KKK Act, but the one um, that, that we are proving requires a conspiracy to use um, force, intimidation, or threats. Um, for the purpose of either preventing a federal, or preventing someone from taking federal office that they're entitled to. So in the context of this case, that means trying to prevent uh, President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris from taking the office to which they were elected. Um, or you can also prove it as relevant to this case um, by trying to prevent federal officials from discharging their official duties. So in that case, that includes the members of Congress who are required um, to convene a session in order to allow the certification votes to happen. That includes preventing then Vice President Pence from certifying the electoral votes. Um, and uh, I don't want to repeat too much. Vikram laid out so much so nicely, but uh, just to expand a little bit on the goal, of course, um, getting um, whatever restitution we can um, for uh, the district and um, for the you know the brave law enforcement officers who who responded to the attack. Um, and were, were viciously assaulted and suffered physical and mental injuries because of it. Um, that's part of it, but also want, um, and looking at it through the accountability lens, um, kind of 
I tend to think of this, this sort of like the prosecutorial lens, but thinking about the purposes uh, of, of punishment. And so one is deterrence. So one is to send a message that if you engage in these sort of actions, there are consequences. To send that message to others who might try to do so in the future. Um, and the other, incapacitation. So this isn't quite the same. This is a civil suit. Nobody, I mean, there are separate criminal actions, but people aren't going to jail on account of this lawsuit. But we're trying to hit them in the pocketbook to make these organizations, these individuals who engaged in this conduct, um, to make it more difficult for them to do so in the future. Um, and I understand that we might hear from uh, Dr. Jensen as to whether those sorts of accountability efforts uh, are likely to succeed. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave it at that to continue the remarks. Thank you. Just a very quick reminder before we move on to the next panelist. The QR codes, if you have questions, the, the machine is working. If you're old school, that's fine. Raise your hand. But please uh, make my life a little bit easier if you can uh, scan it so I can repeat it back to the live stream. Everyone more? So I want to begin by sharing the words of one of the great writers of the past century, Zora Neale Hurston. She writes, I have been in sorrow's kitchen and licked out all the pots. Then I have stood on the peaky mountain wrapped in rainbows with the harp and sword in my hands. And I started there because what happened to our church, Metropolitan African Methodist Episcopal Church, we're at 1518 M Street Northwest, about five or six blocks from the White House, intentionally planted there by our ancestors to lift up a narrative different than the narrative of the American empire, a truly inclusive reality, which we have not been, one where democracy is shared equally, which we still don't do, and a theological reality where God is maker, creator, sustainer of all, and where abundance is possible for all. And so I think because of that, our church and a sister church, Asbury United Methodist Church, were targeted by the Proud Boys. They burned Asbury United Methodist Church's uh, Black Lives Matter sign down. They came on our property. They tore down our sign and uh, had some moments of, of shouting out vitriol and epithets and, and things of that nature. And so I was made aware of what happened on Sunday morning. So we had been in the church, this is pre Pre, well, not, well, we were in COVID, but we had gone to the church to do some stuff. We have always had security because we've had threats before. So we left, and then my security gentleman called me, and he said, something's not right. Later on that morning, I began to get social media alerts, and I finally put together that, that they had trespassed and desecrated our, our property. And at that point, I was filming uh, worship well, that tells you how old I am. We were doing YouTube, so we were live streaming, not filming, live streaming worship. And right before it was time to begin worship and to preach and to do the things that I do, I got the news. And at first I was thrust into Sorrow's Kitchen, but quickly I stood on the mountain with my harp and my sword, determined to fight. Because this is a fight that we have always had to fight, and it is a fight that will continue as long as America exists. This is baked into the reality of what America is, and we fool ourselves if we think otherwise. And it will take a radical kind of surgery to change it. And so Cornell Brooks connected us with the Lawyers Committee and with Paul Weiss, and I spoke with the members of our congregation, the leaders, and to a person, we all agreed to fight. Because fighting is what we have done, even though the war in court has been a blip to fight for the rights of all people, even though the majority of the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court has been about protecting the rights of property and the rights of corporations. We fight because every now and then we can push forward, and that is what we are doing. We have a wonderful legal team. You don't want me to get involved uh, with any of that, but, uh, and it's also striking that I'm going to be the most brief, and I'm the preacher. <laughs> uh, but I want to be very clear that we are doing this in the spirit of Mumbet, Elizabeth Freeman, who was the first person, a woman of African descent, who sued for her freedom in the 1700s. In the words of the poet Sterling Brown, we will keep coming, and we will not be stopped. Thank you, Reverend. Amen. All right. 
Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'll actually uh, start by telling you uh, what I'm not. Uh, what I'm not is uh, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not involved in any of the legal proceedings against these two organizations, whether that's the criminal or the civil uh, proceedings. In fact, if, if you're getting legal advice from me or if I'm the brains behind your legal strategy, you're in big, big trouble. Um, I view my role here uh, is to bring a social science lens to this question, uh, what next for the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys. And we have um, a couple of decades of, of research now on what happens to these organizations when you disrupt their leadership. Um, and we know a bit now about how organizations like the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys come to an end. Um, but before I do that, I thought maybe I'd give just the real brief history of these groups, just in case anyone in this room actually isn't familiar with the Oath Keepers um, and the Proud Boys and, 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 and what, they, what they stand for. Uh, the Oath Keepers were formed in 2009 by former Army paratrooper Elmer Stewart Rhodes. He had just got done working on Ron Paul's failed presidential bid when he started the group. Uh, they assert that their main mission is to protect the Constitution from all threats, foreign and domestic. Um, that sounds innocent enough, but when you actually look into the group and, and what they preach, you realize that they are immersed in conspiracy theories about government overreach. And one of the overarching narratives of the Oath Keepers is that the U.S. government is working with its foreign allies in the United Nation to strip U.S. citizens of their rights, the most important of which is the right to bear arms, um, and that they're looking to usher in an era of socialism. Uh, they recruit heavily from military, law enforcement, and first responder communities. They play on this idea of taking an oath to defend the country um, as a recruitment tool. Um, the group has gotten a lot of attention, rightfully so, because of uh, their participation in the January 6th event, and, and my team has identified at least 42 of the January 6th defendants have some links to the Oath Keepers organization, including uh, Stuart Rhodes himself. However, this is not the first time that the Oath Keepers caused trouble. Um, the data that we've collected, we found that the uh, members of the Oath Keepers have been involved in at least 23 criminal events since their founding in 2009. They've been very active in public demonstrations, um, especially as counter protesters on the side of law enforcement. Um, uh, so, for example, um, they arrived in Ferguson, Missouri after the killing of Mike Brown to protest on the side of law enforcement during those demonstrations. Uh, they've also been involved in numerous standoffs with the U.S. government, they famously joined uh, the Bundys in Nevada in 2014. Uh, the Proud Boys were formed in 2016 by Gavin McGinnis, who's the co-founder of Vice News. They describe themselves as Western chauvinists, and they claim that they're simply celebrating uh, their European heritage, and they refuse to uh, apologize for creating the modern world, as they said. However, many of the groups members openly espouse views of, of white nationalism and white supremacy. Many of them have links to groups that more overtly um, are more overtly racist and anti-Semitic. They often try to also play off their extreme and, and violent behavior by just describing themselves as a, as a boys club, as a drinking club, like that's some kind of excuse for their street borrowing activity. Um, Again, they've received a lot of attention because of January 6th, but January 6th was not the first time that Proud Boys um, have found themselves causing trouble. They've been causing trouble since the day they were formed. Um, my team has uh, identified over 100 Proud Boys that have been charged for committing crimes since 2016. Um, we've identified 82 of the Capitol defendants who are either members of the organization who are, or who publicly supported um, the group prior to January 6th. Uh, so what does social science research tell us about how groups like the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys come to an end? Uh, a lot of research on this in the post-9-11 environment. And, and outside, um, what you learn from that research is that leadership disruptions are actually a fairly common way in which governments try to end these organizations. And we have this you know, wonderful natural exper uh, experiment right now where we have these two organizations that are undergoing significant leadership disruption. Their leaders are in jail because of January 6th. They're facing criminal prosecution and civil prosecution. Um, so what do we know about how often leadership disruption leads to the end of these organizations? Well, research tells us that it's largely dependent on three things. Uh, the size and relative popularity of the group. Uh, groups that are big and popular have a base that they can recruit from. Um, and more importantly than that, uh, they have donors. 
And so it's already been mentioned that one of the hopes of, of the, the, the civil litigation against these groups is that it might bankrupt them. Um, that's harder to do when they have lots of people willing to open up their pocketbooks to support them. And unfortunately, what we've seen in some of the cases of Oath Keepers and Proud Boys that have, have crowdsourced funding for their legal defenses is that some of them have actually done quite well in raising hundreds of thousands of dollars in support of, of their own legal defense because of January 6. So size and relative popularity. Uh, the age of the group and its level of institutionalization in politics is another key. You know, how familiar are people with the organizations? How, how normal is it for these groups to be a part of, of political activity can make it harder to defeat them? And then finally, and perhaps more, most important, is the leadership structure of the organization, uh, organization. Is this a hierarchical group in which a lot of power is concentrated in one individual or a couple of individuals? Or is this a more flat organization where there are lots of local leaders dispersed around? What research shows is that um, it's a lot harder to defeat those flat organizations that have lots of leaders. If you take out one leader, there's another leader uh, waiting in the wings to take over and, and to run the group. Uh, groups that are hierarchical uh, concentrate uh, power in, in one person or small set of persons. You take out that person, you kill, you capture them. Um, often they're, they're left faltering, not knowing what to do next. They may not have a succession plan in place uh, to replace those individuals. Um, and in many cases, the groups can kind of just, just wilt away and die. So these are kind of the three components of whether or not a group that's uh, experienced leadership disruption uh, will ultimately end. Is it small? Is it young and is it hierarchically organized with lots of power concentrated in, in one uh, individual? So to what extent uh, is any of this true of the Proud Boys um, or the Oath Keepers? Well, in terms of their relative age, um, you know, when you look at it internationally and you look at some of these Maoist organizations that have been around since the 1960s, they're not terribly old groups. But actually, when you consider that most extremist groups don't make it to their first birthday, um, they are actually, you know, middle-aged, I guess, is the best way to say it. You know, the Oath Keepers have been around for about 13 years, and the Proud Boys have been around um, for about six. Uh, their size is hard to get a grasp on. Um, they boast large membership numbers. So Stuart Rhodes has famously declared that there are 35,000 dues-paying members of the Oath Keepers. We know from leaked data from September of 2021 20, uh, that those numbers might actually be fairly accurate. The leaked data on 38,000 individuals um, that were affiliated with the group um, in some way. They were not all active members necessarily, but that's still, those are really, really big numbers. And we know that uh, the Proud Boys have chapters all throughout uh, the United States and, um, and, and, and do have sizable membership. So on those two measures, uh, these groups are going to be difficult to defeat. You know, they have some longevity to them. They, they have a following. They're somewhat popular. I think the one big difference here between these two organizations is in their leadership structures and what that means for them moving forward. Um, both of them on paper are organized with a national leadership and then local chapters with local leaders throughout the country. However, in reality, uh, historically, the Oath Keepers have concentrated a lot more power in Stuart Rhodes himself um, and his top lieutenants. They've had a lot of say over, uh, he and his top lieutenants have had a lot of say over what the group has said and done. So famously, when um, individuals that were present at the Bundy Ranch decided to go up to Oregon to occupy a wildlife refuge up there, Stuart Rhodes said, no way, we're not going. We haven't been invited by the locals. This is illegitimate. And for the most part, the Oath Keepers listened to what he said. He said, no, we're not going, and they didn't go. The Proud Boys have uh, been organized with their local chapters having a lot more autonomy to do what they want. There is a national leadership that's generally um, um, guiding some principles and some ideas, but local leaders have had a lot of say in showing up at demonstrations and rallies and, and, and just generally causing trouble. So in, in practice, a little bit uh, flatter than the Oath Keepers. Um, and we've seen that in about the 20 months since January 6th that these two groups have behaved in very different ways that seem to indicate that the leadership um, that, that the impact on the leadership is, is quite different for these two organizations. So if you look at the Proud Boys over the last 20 months and what they've been up to, is it's business as usual. They're causing lots of trouble. Right? So they're showing up at school board meetings and health board meetings. They're showing up uh, at pride events, marching, marching alongside the Patriot Front. Uh, they're showing up at abortion rallies. 
um, it, it's, it's, it's really, they're being quite active, and according to the SPLC, the number of local chapters of the Proud Boys has actually grown since January 6th. So they're doing quite well in its business as usual, but when you look at the business as usual and who's leading it, it's hyper-localized. It's these local chapters that are going into their own communities and causing problems, right? Showing up at the school board and health board meetings being an intimidating force. The Oath Keepers, on the other hand, have been virtually silent since January 6th. Right? They've shown up at a couple of demonstrations. There was one demonstration outside of a courthouse um, that was organized to support the January 6th defendants in which they had a show of force there. But for the most part, they really haven't been, been demonstrating like they, like they used to. They have not been very active, um, and we have not had any arrests beyond the January 6th cases of any Oath Keepers in the last uh, 20 months. Now, this could be evidence um, that this has to do with the fact that the leadership is disrupted. This is a hierarchical organization that took its cue from what Stuart Rhodes and his top lieutenant said, and they're sitting in jail right now not able uh, to lead the organization. Some of it could also be strategic. They just they want the heat off and they want the attention off. But it, it could be an indication that the leadership disruption is having more of an effect on the Oath Keepers right now because of their structure um, than it is having on the Proud Boys. Um, I'll, I'll say this as the kind of concluding remark, is that ultimately whether or not a, a legal or civil strategy works in ending these, these groups um, may not matter if we're not tackling the ideas that motivated the groups in the first place and motivated individuals to join them. And on that front, I think we've made far less progress. And, and there's actually a bit of a warning from the research here, which is that if you have an organization like the Oath Keepers um, that is generally very popular, um, has lots of followers, uh, potentially, um, whose ideas are still very, very popular, and you disrupt the leadership and, and the group falters a bit, that all it takes is a political entrepreneur to come forward mm. and pick up the pieces. And often the way they do that and the way they mobilize people to their cause is to be even more extreme than the last leaders, right? We're gonna be better than that group. We're gonna be more active than that group. We're gonna be more violent than that group. So there is a risk here of, of a dangerous splintering effect that can happen um, if we don't tackle the ideas behind the, the, the groups and, and the reasons why people find them. Uh, appeal. Thank you, Michael. Um, thank you all for your, your presentations. Um, Reverend Lamar, you were the, the shortest one on the group. You're absolutely <laughs> right. Uh, and I think you should give some pointers to my priest on Sundays. Uh, so I'm going to give you the first question uh, as people kind of think through the QR codes and other questions come in. What did you say to your congregation the week after? How do you bring some level of hope after mm -hmm. something like that happens? It's a wonderful question. I think that is written into our theological and homiletical DNA. It's the fancy word we use to talk about the art of preaching. Um, when you have a people who have balanced sorrow and fighting and joy, you just keep telling the truth that the sun rises and we... I was talking with someone about my cufflinks uh, that were given to me by an African family in the congregation, and, and it, it has an adinkra symbol. I don't know if you all are familiar with the adinkra symbols, but one of them is the Sankofa, and you, you all might want to research that. The Sankofa bird within, um, within the understanding of the adinkra symbol is a bird that is flying forward while looking backward with an egg in its mouth. And the idea is that we're called to go back and fetch that which keeps us alive and flourishing. And so that's at the heart of, of, of what we talk about. And we know, and, and I can stop here, that the victory is in the perpetual fight, the refusal to relinquish the human impulse that uh, I will not allow anyone uh, to trample on who I am. And, and, and it's even beyond that. I mean, we're, we're in an environment here where we're talking about the tree of life and we're talking about uh, anti-Semitic type forms of hate. Um, that has to do with ancestry. That has to do with story. That has to do with how people uh, identify themselves. And I have taken this language, I think, from cultural anthropologists call our species homo nerens. Uh, 
as opposed to Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens, of course, has to do with tool making and wisdom, but Homo narens has to do with the fact that we are creatures that live and die by story, by myth. And so we are ordered by a story that calls us to continue to fight, to create. And I think the last thing is there's a great beauty and in, in black joy and the black refusal to stop living and asserting ourselves, which this, this type of American political violence is an assault on that joy and an assault on a refusal to die. And so we will never capitulate to that. And that's, that's what we talk about. Thank you. Thank you very much. In struggle, there's, there's nobility in struggle, oh, yeah. uh, however frustrating and consistent it is. Yeah. Um, Thank you. We have our, our first question from the group, so you all were listening. I appreciate that. Um, and Vikram and Colin, this might be more up your alley. Um, and Michael, you might want to jump in too, which is, today's self-described Proud Boys are extremely active across the U.S., both in direct violence and harassment incidents, as well as becoming increasingly involved in local politics in multiple states. Research suggests there's a minimal national level coordination between the localized Proud Boy groups. Does the, does the D.C. case impact these present-day activities if there's no direct connection between the named individuals on January 6th and maybe the, the local chapters that don't have that connective tissue? There may be less of a direct impact on that type of um, structure for the reasons that were laid out in terms of the difference between you know, a, a top-down bureaucracy and a sort of more decentralized system. But I think what, what we've laid out is an outline for how to proceed against um, groups that may try to use violence or other improper means to influence a government body, right? So the, the, obviously there, there are legitimate uses of protest and, and holding governments to account. What is not permitted is to use violence, to use um, disruption in a way that injures people and injures local governments. And so I hope what we've done and, and, and you know, hopefully that's one of the takeaways of this, is to lay out a roadmap by which other local governments, other state governments that are facing the types of, um, that are facing the types of challenges that the federal government faced on January 6th that had a spillover effect into the District of Columbia can take um, steps to address those harms that they suffer. If it's okay, maybe I'll ask a follow-up question that's more related to you. There's a question about, okay, D.C. government and then D.C. Uh, Attorney General's office has the resources, right? But how do the smaller organizations, how do the smaller cities kind of wrap their head around this? I wonder if you could just dive in a little bit, like, how did this public-private partnership work out? Like, how do you work out the lanes of the, of the road and whose responsibilities are what? So it's all um, kind of a negotiation as you go. Uh, so You're winning, though, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so where... Um, our organization um, works, like I mentioned at the beginning, we work um, with state and local officials across the country, and not just on accountability efforts. So we're in touch with um, attorneys general offices, secretary of states, county officials, um, kind of working on proactive um, measures, trying, on, um, trying to make sure elections function smoothly in all sorts of capacities. And so we had been doing that. And we also worked with, um, we were kind of a nascent organization um, in the, uh, during the 2020 election. Um, so we'd be in, we had been in touch with um, various officials. Then January 6th happened. And so the conversation just sort of naturally continued to brainstorming about what can we do about that. Um, we also were and continue to work closely um, with a network of pro bono partners, um, uh, private law firms who um, dedicate their time um, and, and expertise to these efforts, um, and, and also other nonprofits. So um, kind of with this partnership, um, you, and, and, and part of the idea is that, and I know this from my experience in, in government, that um, the amount of um, important work that any particular government office could do if they had the resources to do it, like always um, exceeds what they have the capacity to do. So what we try to do is to, um, is to try to offer some extra support so they can leverage um, 
leverage their authority and also some expertise because a, a, an office in a particular state might be experiencing a particular type of election crisis for the first time, but um, when you have an organization um, or a, an issue with extremists for the first time, but when you have an organization like States United that focuses on these dis disruptions to democracy or an organization like uh, ADL that works on extremism across the country, we can bring to bear that expertise. Um, and then, of course, a huge shout out to our law firm partners, um, in this case, Paul Weiss and Decker. We work with other law firms on, on other projects, other cases, um, who really have both the resources and that litigation yep. expertise that is so critical, particularly in a, in a complex case like this. The one, the one thing that I would just add to that, right, like, is that regardless of how many resources a, a local government has, part of it is, part of being in local government is being connected to the communities that we represent, right? And so when, the, when January 6th happened and the Proud Boys uh, harmed the, district, uh, of the district's government, we already knew a lot about the Proud Boys because of our relationship with Reverend Lamar. And, you know, we had had extensive conversations between, what was it, December 12th, is that yeah. right? Yeah. And January 6th about uh, what was going on. And so we knew that Paul Weiss was working with um, with Reverend Lamar and, and, and his congregants to, to, to move forward on litigation. And so we knew that they had the expertise to, to be able to serve um, effectuate service of process in this sort of difficult situation. We knew because we were engaged across the country on concerns about whether the elections in 2020 would be free and fair, we, we were engaged with States United and other organizations to really think about how to protect um, the election and make sure that uh, voters across the country in states you know, where the stakes were much higher than they were in the District of Columbia had their voices heard. And so because we had our ear to the ground, um, both in, in, within D.C., but also across um, issues across the country, I think we were able to move quickly and, and um, build these partnerships and build these relationships to bring together the relevant subject matter experts quickly to, to take the actions that we needed to take. Okay. Thank you. The questions are rolling in now. Uh, so, Mike, I think this one, you know, there's an old saying in, in counter-extremism or counter underlying extremism efforts, you can't arrest your way out of the problem, right? Mm -hmm. However, uh, there's been dozens of folks who've been arrested on January 6th uh, for the Oath Keepers, dozens for Proud Boys. And so the question from here is, is the prosecution having a deterrent for their membership, or is January 6th a rallying cry for them? Yeah, that, that's a difficult question to answer. Of course, these are clandestine groups that don't openly share their membership roles with us, so we don't know how well that they've done uh, recruiting since January 6th. However, um, there, there are a couple things we do know. First of all, is, you know, think about why do the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys feel uh, so emboldened on January 6th? Why do they think they can arrive at the Capitol on that day? And, and why do they have these delusions in their head that they're going to be called up as you know, a, a national security force um, uh, to help reinstall Trump uh, as president? And that's because they had a lot of political support leading up to January 6th. Um, and what seems true is that they, they still have um, an awful lot of political support. And that's bad news for those of us who would like to see their numbers uh, dwindle. So if you look at the, the leak of the data that came from the Oath Keepers from about uh, a year ago, there are some big name individuals um, on that list. You know, it's people like Wendy Rogers and it's sheriffs and it's, it's, it's politicians and, and people that have a lot of influence in their communities. And this is, you know, this is nine, ten months after January 6th that this, this data is leaking and they still have this level of support in U.S. communities and, and, and that's bad news. Um, in terms of, of stopping them and, and, and thwarting their recruitment uh, capabilities. Uh, but again, um, whether uh, it's called the Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers or the Three Percenters or whatever else, if we don't get at the ideas, it, it doesn't matter if the Oath Keepers end. There will be a new group to take over that mantle um, and to recruit veterans and law enforcement and first responders into the ranks. Um, if, if we don't tackle ideas of white nationalism and white supremacy, there will be another group um, that are promoting those beliefs and, and recruiting. They, they may not call themselves the Proud Boys, but they'll, they'll be as, as problematic. Um, 
So I, I think that's, that's really the key. It's hard to know how well they're doing uh, right now in terms of recruiting. The signs are not positive um, that we have, but ultimately I, I don't know that it matters if we don't get at the, at the heart of why these groups exist in the first place. Right. It's one thing to go after the money and the organization, another thing to go after the movement of the idea of it. Um, questions from the crowd? For anyone who's old school? No judgments. Yes? I'm going to repeat back the question for people on the live stream just so everyone knows. Okay, so the question for the folks in the live stream is, um, the Proud Boys were designated as a terrorist group in New Zealand and Canada. Uh, does that open the door for the U.S. government to look at them as a foreign terrorist organization and designate them as such? And I'm looking to the right, uh, to my lawyers, because I think on the left, I think I, think I know what the answer is going to be left. But let's go with the, the lawyers. And, or you can say, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that. No. That's not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't know the answer to that either. I think, you know, I think one of the things that we saw, you know, in the 2020, uh, 2021 time period, and that was also referenced in the previous panel on Charlottesville is, you know, the federal government, which is responsible for these types of designations and these types of decisions is not always a reliable ally to communities that are most affected. And I think that that sort of spotlights some of the necessity of you know, state and local government involvement in, in issues like this. And so obviously we as a local government cannot designate anybody much of anything, but what we can do is we can act when, when, when we see wrongdoing. So goes DC, so goes the country, right? That's um, what say. <laughs> as a DC native, as a DMD native, <laughs> I agree. Um, we know we, when you look at the State Department's designation of foreign terrorist organizations, only one of them is a far right extremism uh, group and they designated it two years ago and the State Department has been quiet since. Um, so it takes a little bit of political will uh, for it, and it opens up a whole host of other legal issues that would probably take us another hour or two of a panel on it. Um, unfortunately, I'm getting uh, the, the notification that we have the keynote speaker in, in two minutes, so I, unfortunately, I have to end the panel there, but I should say a few things. Um, one is, that was fascinating. Um, you all are on the cutting edge, and unfortunately so sometimes, uh, of this issue. Um, and the decisions you make in the coming weeks will determine kind of the future of these organized hate groups of which have recruited a number of folks. Um, I want to thank you for your time here. I, I imagine you'll stay around for a few minutes if people have questions they weren't confident enough to ask in front. And I'm reminded, you know, you're looking at a 100-year-old uh, law on the KKK to prosecute this case. History doesn't repeat, but it damn sure rhymes sometimes, uh, unfortunately so. Um, so if everyone could join me in thanking our panelists for this talk.